Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Myths and Misconceptions of Rainwater Harvesting webinar. My name is Mitch, and I'll be moderating this, this webinar for everyone and being the liaison between you and Peter and Michelle and Brad. And today we are going to be busting some myths about rainwater harvesting. And um, as I said earlier, if you weren't there, there will be a question period after about half an hour. So we'll be talking for about an hour, uh, give or take. And um, I have noticed that there is a, uh, a Q&A tab at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, this is my first Zoom webinar. Um, so we'll try that out. I am generally used to people just typing in their questions right into the chat with a hashtag and then capital all caps question and then typing your question. Um, if you, if you do type your questions into the chat, please use that format. It makes it really easy for me to find those questions. Otherwise, the, the Q&A will pop up here as well, so I can monitor that and then log all your questions for that half an hour later. Um, and uh, we, that being said, we don't have too much time, about an hour, so we're going to get right into some introductions. So I'd love to introduce uh, Dr. Peter Coombs, Michelle Avis, and Brad Lancaster. And I'm going to let them talk about themselves here, but uh, for, for each of you, I've got a couple questions that I would like for you to answer, and that'll give, give our audience a little bit of an introduction as to who you are and where you're coming from and why you're doing this. So I've got three questions for you, and that is, where are you in the world, and how does that influence your rainwater harvesting context? And then what's the favorite rainwater harvesting project you have worked on? And then finally, what is the most tangible benefit you see rainwater harvesting having on the world? And I'll give it to Michelle first. All right, so I am in Alberta in Canada. I just was incredibly emotional. And it's, well, you know, we're, we're cold climate up here where we have uh, several months of the year, um, you know, even four, where we get below freezing temperatures. So the context for rainwater harvesting up here is quite different from other places in the world, especially if we want to do year round rainwater harvesting. So that's how my climate impacts what we do. We would tend to, in, in year round systems, want to be putting our rainwater tanks underground or find other ways to prevent them from freezing into solid blocks of ice. So it's a little bit more of a technical challenge. And there's also a lot less rainwater harvesting where, you know, where I live compared to in Australia, where I was first introduced to rainwater harvesting. And I think the climate is part of that. Um, there's, there's also a whole bunch of uh, other factors that I think influence why it's so much less common to harvest rainwater, especially for drink, like for indoor use, right? Not just for use in your garden. Mm -hmm. My favorite project is definitely my own project. <laughs> uh, we just moved to a farm about a year ago and we're putting in a year round rainwater collection and system with a backup from a pump, from a, sorry, from a groundwater pump and groundwater well. And what was your last question, Mitch? I got that, that uh, and potential for rainwater. What is the most tangible benefit you see rainwater harvesting having on the world? Oh, man, I don't know. I mean, I think I got into rainwater because I started to realize how crucial water, the water piece was to sustainable systems and sustainability in general, and how grossly under-respected it was um, in the way we design our, our you know, human habitat and our, and our people systems. And, um, you know, just negligent, we're really negligent when it comes to water. And so there's just so much potential in Canada and North America to, to do better with water and, and harvest water instead of always pumping water from, uh, you know, far away places, even mm -hmm. different watersheds, right? So uh, there's so much growth opportunity in, in Canada in particular, but I'd say North America with rainwater harvesting. Awesome. Well, let's uh, let's shift gears and go all the way across the world to Peter. And Peter, I'll pose those same questions to you. Um, let me know if you need me to repeat those. I might get you to prompt me as we go, but I can start off. I'm in 
Carrington, which is in Newcastle, about an hour north of Sydney, New South Wales in Australia. We're heading to about 30 degrees today. So sorry guys, 30 degrees Celsius. Um, and it's going to be rather warm. Uh, they, uh, what got me into rainwater harvesting, well, I think was your second question, the same as Michelle, entirely by accident during my PhD, um, because I came from out, Outback Australia where we valued water, any water we can get. And a bit similar to Brad Lancaster, who's speaking today. I came from an arid place and we used rainwater. It supplied our whole house, um, as does most rural Australians. And um, I valued water and I was doing systems analysis of water resources and I was being discouraged to add rainwater harvesting and uh, water savings and any other water source and sustainable thinking to this very traditional exercise and I, it didn't make sense to me so I added it in and I've been doing rainwater harvesting plus all of water cycle ever since. I um, My favourite project is probably the um, I'm a system scientist, so I've got backgrounds in uh, microbiology, um, engineering, um, law and economics, so I'm a bit weird. So but com combining those disciplines and rainwater harvesting and things that happen at the property scale, uh, what, what I call bottom up, but when you think about it, whole of society is driven by the bottom up, by the people and things rather than from the top down, as you might believe if you li listen to most of the commentary or read reports. So, but if you work in government policy, which I do, you're actually trying to change behavior to get a better outcome for whole of society. So they're, they're my favorite projects. Mitch, I've got a couple of slides of my own house, which is sustainable. It, it, can I share those? Yeah, um, I believe you have the appropriate superpowers to, to do that. Oh, cool. And I'll give it a go. No, um, the host has disabled my screen sharing. So oh, well, let me let me let me change that for you. Yeah. There you go. You should be able to. Wow, I've got superpowers now. So yes. um, Just need to find it. I think we might move on and come back to that. I'll find that uh, a bit later, Mitch. So. All good. Um, we'll just move on to Brad, and uh, yeah. I'll pose the same same questions to Brad. So, where are you in the world, and how did that influence your rainwater harvesting context? your favorite rainwater harvesting project you've worked on and the most tangible benefit you see rainwater harvesting having on the world. Yep, so I'm in the uh, Sonoran Desert on the uh, US-Mexican border. Um, and so uh, we are uh, uh, an arid climate, we get quite hot. Uh, the record um, highs are around 118 degrees Fahrenheit, which uh, I think are about 47, 48 degrees Celsius. And our average annual rainfall is about 11 inches a year, um, or in uh, millimeters, I think that's uh, 290 millimeters per year. Um, we have two rainy seasons, one in the winter and one in the summer, but we can definitely have years where we miss one of those rainy seasons. And uh, in 2020 was our driest year on record with just uh, four inches of, uh, of rainfall. I think that, um, was that 25 millimeters? Um, uh, sorry, my metric conversion, that's so good. Um, so uh, how does this influence me? Well, it influences me um, in that there is such incredible um, life, um, so many species, uh, you know, animals, insects, uh, birds, soil microbes, whatnot, that have learned to adapt in this extreme environment. And uh, uh, I find water harvesting to be a key element of that. And many of these species do harvest water such as the horn lizard, which harvests rainwater off its roof-like back um, via gutters um, between its scales to its mouth. Um, and uh, 
We also uh, have a lot of modern problems, a modern induced scarcity, and in that Tucson is the home of over a dozen Superfund sites. These are environmental protection agency recognized sites of major contamination of our groundwater. So um, while uh, the groundwater is our largest water supply, um, a great deal of that is no longer available due to its uh, contamination. So uh, I've been motivated to harvest rainwater to um, mitigate these scarcities, these uh, natural scarcities in our dry seasons and droughts and the human caused scarcity of contamination of our water resources. Um, what's the favorite um, rainwater project I've worked on? Uh, well, kind of like Michelle, I gotta say it's my, my home based project because uh, I'm you know, around it the most. So it's not just my home, but it's really more what I'm doing in the neighborhood with my neighbors and whatnot. So um, we've converted solar oven like barren streets into uh, streets that are now shaded with a growing canopy of native food bearing uh, trees and understory plants that are irrigated with uh, passively harvested street runoff and rainfall. So we're using this system to actually control flooding uh, while at the same time creating a more verdant and uh, heat island abating uh, landscape. Um, we've brought in over a dozen native bird species that had disappeared from our neighborhood. Now we've regrown much of their habitat. Uh, and we harvest well over a million gallons of stormwater a year um, in this uh, and have planted over 1600 trees. And then the last question, what's the most tangible benefit uh, you see rainwater harvesting in the world? Uh, I think it's a fantastic opportunity to give back to the living systems that enable us to live and so many other species to live. It gives us this wonderful opportunity to give back more to those living systems, those ecological systems than we take from them and to mimic the planetary hydrologic cycle, which, uh, you know, there's a finite amount of fresh water on this planet, but yet the planet never runs out of fresh water because of all these natural systems of the hydrologic cycle that recycle that water again and again and again in ways that upgrade or at least maintain the quality. So I take that as my inspiration of, you know, how can I do likewise with my practices, practices at home in the community and with clients. Very, very cool. I, that's a very cool wizard adaption. That's neat. Actually, I didn't know about that. And uh, that is here. Do you, uh, do you by any chance have that, that slideshow about your own house that you wanted to share up? Yes. Um, I've hit the share button. How are we going? So, share. So, how's that? I can see it. So, um, fantastic, Brad and Michelle. Uh, this is my own house. Um, we we're early adopters of inner city urban rainwater harvesting in Australia. This has been going on for over 20 years. Um, it, solar and rainwater first and grid second for energy and water for the very reasons Brad's talked about, about giving back. So we're being a scientist, we've measured everything that's moved in this house for over 20 years. So I like data. Um, you can tell me whatever you like, but show me the data. So. There it is, um, the picture on the side with the frangipani, you can see there's the solar battery storage there, the white box, and after that is a 5,000 litre rainwater storage and it's, it has uh, 18 solar panels on the roof. Um, this is what happened to the house since we decided to do rainwater harvesting. This is our utility water use um, in, thousand liters uh, yeah thousand liters per day kilolitres per day as you can see when we've transitioned from utility water use to rainwater use backed up by utility use we've got a massive change in the use of rainwater in the house but energy is important too because everything's a system they're not really separate um, you can see the uh, energy use in the uh, summer peaks in energy use in our part of the world. It might be winter peaks in your part of the world. Um, and transitioning the battery storage and putting the, the green part of the graph there is putting energy back into the grid. 71% uh, reduction in energy use and bills there. So, and 
Stormwater runoff is the other thing that people um, don't think much about. In the cities, we drown waterways by the hard surfaces, putting too much water into the urban waterways, and we kill off lots of species and so on in that way. So the, the red dots are what would have happened without the rainwater harvesting system. And also we've got permaculture type uh, processes in the house. So we've got vegetable gardens and so on. And the, the, um, the green triangles is what's happened after installation of the rainwater harvesting uh, and veggie garden type process. So dramatic reductions and the line, the dark blue line is water levels in the tank. And finally, yes, sometimes we're on mains water, sometimes, which is green and some uh, green for rainwater and blue for mains water. And that was in a, a time when we had water restrictions here and low rainfall, but still a significant part of the, uh, the household supply was rainwater. So thanks, Mitch, I'll unshare that. <laughs> I work out how to do that. I could just take away your superpowers. Yeah, you could do that, Mitch. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you, Brad and Peter and Michelle for, for your introduction. I'm sure it gives a little bit of context to everyone as to where you're coming from and um, why you're doing what it is that you, what you are doing. Let's see. I'm just going to take that away. That should take away Peter's superpowers and we're back to normal now. And so I've got, I've got a list of, of myths that I would like busted by you guys. Um, I've been scouring the internet for these myths and come across them in my own research as well for rainwater harvesting. Uh, and the, the first myth actually comes um, when, I, when I was talking about rainwater harvesting on Reddit and uh, some other threads. And for the most part, a lot of people think that rainwater harvesting is as simple as directing rainwater from your roof into a barrel. So myth number one is rainwater harvesting is putting rain into rain barrels. And that's about the end of it. Uh, I'll just say I totally thought that was that was the case. And it wasn't until I traveled to Australia in 2010. And this is as a you know, in my late 20s, um, that was the first time I saw people harvesting rain other than just a small little, you know, 20 gallon barrel for their garden. And um, I remember having this, why have I never, this makes so much sense, why have I never seen this, right? In terms of, in, in terms of holding back stored water. Um, and then thinking back to my grandmother's house, you know, skipped a generation where she had a cistern in her basement in northern Saskatchewan. And they would harvest, they actually built these integrated cisterns um, to, to harvest the water off the roof because that's the only water they have. They didn't have the municipal water supply. So I just, I'll just comment that I also believed in that myth prior to discovering permaculture and, and just traveling to Australia and seeing use cases where people were actually collecting rain and using them in their home. For, for, yeah, yes, of course, toilet flushing and washing clothes, but also drinking and all the same uses you would have municipal water. And in fact, now I'm even more convinced that it's, it's better and it's healthier and it's the best way to go, like harvest the rain. Um, and I would go that route over using mains water or groundwater any day. Yeah. Um, I'll say that's all, that's all, but I'll pass it on to the others who I'm sure will have more to add to that too. I think um, just adding to, I've got the reverse experience to Michelle um, coming from a country where we're um, outside of a capital city, we're completely reliant on rainwater harvesting and um, from generations of people who worked out how to make it work to working with the Canadian Housing and Mortgage Association years ago. And I was lucky to spend some lovely time in Canada with them. And as soon as we went out of the major cities, in, and I worked in Texas as well during that visit, um, we were finding that people were totally reliant on rainwater, even in North America. And there's that history that Michelle's talking about of the systems in the basin, uh, the, the basement of houses and all sorts of solutions. Um, so the perception of rain barrels is, might be a myth. 
um, or might be only a part of the story, I suspect, even for North America. Yeah, I'll, I'll add that, um, okay, first I need to preface what I'm about to say, okay? So I'm speaking from someone who comes from a dry land environment where we might get just inundated with rain and then have nothing, no more rain for nine months, okay? So um, that being the case, we don't get regular light rains. Um, I think rain barrels are a joke. <laughs> Um, now, what, what I mean by a rain barrel is in a little 55 gallon uh, tank. So it's, it's very small. I'm not talking about the larger tanks. So, and maybe a nicer way of saying it is not, it's not a joke, but it's a toy. It's play, um, like for your, your Barbie or GI Joe set, because um, it's gonna fill up very quickly and it's gonna empty very quickly, at least in my environment. Um, in other environments that might be different. Uh, and uh, so I, I like a much larger tank that's really going to give me more resilience so I can capture, you know, all of the big rain and it can last me much longer into the, into the dry season or drought. Um, but I'll also add to that is uh, um, I typically don't start with um, tanks, although it depends on the context I'm working in. But um, I oftentimes will start with just a shovel and creating um, basin-like shapes. So it I consider harvesting rainwater in a tank to be an active system. It's active because someone has to actively turn on the valve to access the water. Whereas uh, I oftentimes start with passive systems where I'm harvesting rainwater in a rain garden, an earthwork, a, a basin-like shape that's vegetated. So I direct the rainfall and the runoff to that area, store the water in the tank of the soil and pump it out in the form of the living pumps of vegetation. So I can access it in the form of their fruit, shelter, beauty, uh, so on, and, and help recharge the aquifer. Um, so uh, um, at minimum, I'd say, if you're wanting to harvest rainwater actively and or passively, think about doing it both at the same time, integrate the two, marry them, okay, for greater productivity. So uh, if you've got a tank, at minimum, direct the runoff from that, I'm sorry, not the runoff, the overflow from that tank to an adjoining uh, earthwork or rain garden that's planted with vegetation that can grow to shade and cool and shelter the tank, um, then you're getting, you're getting more effectiveness and you're not wasting the overflow, you're using that overflow as a resource. Um, and while you're at it, don't stop there. Uh, <laughs> Let that be your invitation to harvest all free on-site waters. Uh, so look to your air conditioning condensate if you have an air conditioning unit, at least you know, direct that to the earthworks and the vegetation. Look to your household gray water, the lightly used water from your sink showers and so forth, the drain from those, those sources. Don't send that to your tank, your rainwater tank. You don't wanna mix you know, your, your gray water with your nice clean rainwater, because uh, then you're gonna have to that adds complexity of needing to filter. Instead, direct your gray water to living filters of soil life and vegetation, thereby minimizing your need to use your cleaner rainwater because you've already directed the gray water to your planting. So now you can use the rainwater for maybe higher order, cleaner uses like domestic uses before it goes down the drain and is captured as gray water in the landscape. <laughs> Thank you, Brad. That was that was poetic and beautiful thank you and i would uh, i would i would uh, i would say that that myth is effectively busted rainwater harvesting is much more than just putting it in barrels um and but it's a good I, place to get addicted to rainwater harvesting yeah it's a good place to start <laughs> yeah it, it, That's it's true. a gateway practice it's yeah. a gateway <laughs> <laughs> That's it's, fun. it's it's mitch um there's a few questions in the chat but We'll keep moving on, but I, I, as a microbiologist, I want to add that a small amount of storage just sitting there not using constant use will accentuate any problems you might have that won't happen in a, in a, in a, in a larger, clear rainwater storage. So if you're storing a small amount of uh, water in um, a hot climate for a long period of time, um, and not doing anything with it, um, you could 
you could create some other problems. So comparing rain barrels to say larger rainwater harvesting or, or more holistic rainwater harvesting that, that um, Brad is talking about also creates some misconceptions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's one thing to harvest and then one thing to actually use it. It's like taking broccoli out of your garden and then just leaving it in your fridge for weeks on end. Um, okay, the, the second myth or misconception that I like to talk about comes from an article that I read from Discover Magazine, where a citizen science project called Off the Roof tested rainwater that was collected in barrels from roofs all over the world. Their team assessed the microbial quality of the water and focused on pathogens found that are infectious to humans. They found that Salmonella was in roughly 9% of the samples. Giardia was in 5% of the samples. And that there's not, there wasn't much of a difference between um, the, that rainwater that was in barrels and what's ordinarily found in surface water from lakes or rivers and came with the, with the quote that it's important to take proper safety precautions when handling rainwater, like washing your hands and avoiding mouth contact, which effectively translates to no drinking. I have a feeling this was, may, might be somewhat tied to the first myth we discussed, but um, here it goes that uh, rainwater has pathogens in it. That's myth number two. Well then, well then nobody should be out walking in the rain. I'll just start with that. <laughs> I'll pass it on to Peter. <laughs> like, don't, don't ever look up and open your mouth, you know? Yeah, and there I, is a lot of literature out there that would have you think that. <clears throat> I think that's a really great comment, Michelle, because when we introduced rainwater harvesting into urban water policy in Australia, that, that myth was propagated everywhere as, if you get rainwater on your skin or, or anything, it's really harmful for you, so you shouldn't use it. So the counter to that was, wow, the millions of people who drink rainwater untreated in urban Australia, they must all be in hospitals and, you know, don't walk outside. This is where context is very important. I don't know how the testing was done and how they've quoted other studies, but I've, I'm... I read a lot in this area and I publish in this area um, and you can get some very interesting perspectives. But we did the first independent and probably still the only independent longitudinal study of water quality all through what we call the, the rainwater treatment train. So thousands of samples. And what we found is what falls on the roof is not the water quality in your storage and it's certainly not the water quality at your tap or where you might use the water because there's a concept called the rainwater treatment train. Are there pathogens in rainwater? Um, possibly. What is the fate of those pathogens as, you, as, as they, uh, they travel from, from uh, roof through to storage, through to end use of rainwater? will they change dramatically? For example, something like salmonella, which you need a frog or a lizard to deposit it uh, on your roof, um, is, is quite rare in rainwater, orders of magnitude rarer than um, rivers and, and lakes and other water bodies. So I don't know how that statistics was done on the discovery article um, because we tested rivers versus roof water. But what she actually found is um, a pathogen is a mutation of, of um, bacteria. So um, pathogens are more fragile um, uh, to environmental stresses. So heat on a roof, you know, UV light from a sun, uh, just wind, uh, materials blowing, blowing uh, falling on a roof, they're then blowing off. The actions of nature we found actually mitigated a lot of what might fall on a roof. However, there's another interesting perception of the majority of human pathogens that we're worried about come from higher order mammals and humans. 
So if humans or cows aren't defecating on your roof, the chances of getting those pathogens we're worried about in mains water supply are basically non-existent. So there are some other uh, sources. Uh, bird poo contains a form of Ken, sometimes contain a form of Giardia and sometimes a form of Charyptospridium, but it's a different form that we're often talking about in in uh, mains water supplies and uh, the source of major reservoir for crypto and giardia is actually calves from cattle. So, um, so we have to think about what lands on the roof, what stays on the roof, what dies on the roof, what enters the next stage. We'll talk about this in the course that we're running, but the, the next part is a rainwater storage of a decent size is actually a bioreactor. So hungry bacteria, uh, causes bacteria and, uh, and bacteria-dominated biofilms, which eat other bacteria and metals. So, so then as you get through the system, you, um, you have a different quality on the output. But just to finalise this, because we I could talk all day on this, unfortunately. So there's about 12 epidemiology studies of health of people drinking untreated rainwater versus people drinking uh, mains water. And they all find people are healthier or as healthy as drinking treated mains water. So that tells you something else is going on. So I might let other people talk. But what falls on your roof, which people comment on in a lot of this, um, or what might fall on your roof, is actually not the quality of rainwater you'll end up with in a system you've you've managed or set up properly. Thanks. Um, I'll, I'll add a couple things. Uh, uh, well, kind of kind of scattershot. So uh, first off, I'm really impressed with a lot of the, the research that um, Peter has been involved with, um, looking at how, say, the, uh, um, the life within a tank can help filter the tank too. Um, but I'll let Peter speaks that maybe that's further in the class. I don't know. Well, and then just uh, adding on um, the uh, I've also been impressed with how around the world there's just <laughs> different simple practices. Like when I was in Saudi Arabia, um, I found that the, the kids, their, their chore is they get up on the roof before it rains and they sweep it off <laughs> and they sweep out the gutters before it rains. Pretty simple system. Um, I was impressed when I was in Australia to see that um, uh, there's a number of metal roofing companies. They actually sell uh, metal roofing, which they market as being potable grade roofing for potable water harvesting systems. Um, so you can come at it from the cheap way or you know, the more expensive way. Uh, and I'll also just share a little story that um, I had the opportunity to uh, visit a rainwater um, uh, harvesting brewery in Decatur, Georgia, here in the US, that um, they were brewing beer with uh, rainwater that they uh, harvested off the roof of the brewery. And um, they uh, tested the water. Um, and now they were doing uh, filtration to be extra safe. They were doing an activated carbon uh, filter um, after a, a micron filter, uh, but they found that uh, their water was significantly superior in quality, their rainwater was significantly superior in quality to the municipal water in Decatur, Georgia. Um, that's pre before even going through the brewing, brewing process. Uh, so um, that I thought was amazing and the beer was fantastic. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, they were they were shut down because the authorities um, said that they basically had to become apply for and be certified as a uh, commercial um, water provider, um, and that was more of an expense than they could afford at the time. Uh, so um, they're no longer doing the rainwater beer, but I know plenty of home brewers that are, and their beer is fantastic too. Yeah, I definitely find that there's this 
there's this interesting hesitation, especially on the part of regulators and maybe even society at large, you know, it filters down that um, rainwater is more dangerous than groundwater or, uh, you know, or more dangerous than the municipal water. And I, I really love, I want to just reiterate what Peter said in terms of some of the large health studies that were performed on um, very large population numbers where, where when you really look at the health impacts, they were equal, if not maybe slightly more in the favor of rainwater harvesting, rainwater drinkers. And I, I think that, that says it all right there. And these are, and another thing Peter said that maybe you didn't pick up if you're listening, he said these are untreated systems. And um, I'll say, uh, what is an untreated system? Well, that's from a regulator's perspective, that's a system without a black box on the end like a little UV system or a chlorination system, uh, or even a, a, a micro filter, like a high micro filtration, right? Um, the, the systems Peter studied in his health were untreated rainwater. So I find that very interesting. Can I uh, comment on that? And at the same time, pick up a few, a few questions in the chat. So if you don't mind, Mitch, so um, see, Rainwater is not untreated because it's in an, an almost natural treatment train, which uh, Brad's alluded to. We've talked about bioreactors in the tank and the action of other bacteria and uh, the sides is a biofilm, not something harmful. Um, and all sorts of processes going on that are natural. Um, we're in a very engineered world. So when we're talking about treated, if it's um, most of the language around rainwater harvesting has been um, borrowed from utility water supply. So if it doesn't have a, you know, uh, a water treatment plant somewhere at the end of line, it's not treated. That's, that's sort of the philosophy that's talked about. If you look further, we can see um, why, why don't the, the three plus million people, Australians who drink rainwater that's virtually untreated in the traditional sense get sick? It's because as Brad is saying, They've learned how to manage their rainwater and understand their natural treatment trade and you know where to take the water from and how to stop it from turning color or or uh, having mosquitoes enter the storage and people have actually managed their natural system so um, a traditional view based on utility water supply is rainwater is untreated but I would argue it is treated and we need to understand those natural processes and how to intervene as humans to ensure we get the best outcome. There's been a few questions in the chat about acid rain, and I couldn't help but comment on that. So the one thing we found is my first site during our PhD was right in the middle of an industrial centre of what was a coal mining um, port when I did my PhD. So we had very low PhD. Uh, pH, um, rain, acid rain, lots of sulfur in the air, which you would realize is the driver of acid rain, um, and nitrous oxide, and so on. Well, right, first thing I discovered is from the roof, rain was about 4 pH, falls on the roof. By the time it got into the first flush device, where we were also testing, it had changed to 6 pH. By the time it was actually used, um, in the houses, it was 6.5 pH. But we have to remember pH is wrongly applied to rainwater also, because in a healthy environment, our pH of rainwater should be 5.5 because it's a natural carbonate, because there's also a level of um, um, carbon in the atmosphere, a natural level beyond, beyond climate change. And but that's not the same as a polluted atmosphere creating pH. So they're different things. So be careful about pH as well, because it's actually an artifact of um, an industrial age. So the pH of rain, natural rainwater changes very quickly depending on the environment it's in. So, thanks, Mitch. Thanks for all your for your, all your answers on there. I'm getting heaps of questions over here, so it's almost hard for me to um, to, to listen to you guys and register what's going on. But uh, we're gonna we're gonna have a lot of questions in in a short amount of time. We've got 
couple, two or three more uh, myths to actually get busted, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna also say that one's pretty busted as well. Thank you, Peter, Michelle, and Brad. And um, th this third myth is more a matter of economics. It's, uh, it's generally thought that rainwater harvesting provides no benefit to individuals um, or their uh, community. So not only does it cost a lot to actually set up their rainwater harvesting system, which is something that I'm uh, staring down the, the rain barrel of no pun intended, um, it's, it's a lot of people are all the argument is that it's just water flowing out of my tap. Why would I do this? The, the impacts are minimal. And um, so this myth is rainwater harvesting is both expensive and doesn't have a tangible impact, i.e. it's not really worth the investment. Oh, oh I think okay. Peter's for sure. Oh, and you too, Brad. I'm going to leave it to you two to, to hash that one out. This time. <laughs> Well, I'll just throw in a couple things real quick. So first off, um, come taste the municipal water where I live, okay? And then spit it out. Then taste the rainwater from your roof. Delicious! <laughs> so rainwater is known around the world as sweet water because it has never hit this, well, depending on how you harvest it, oftentimes it has never hit the soil and picked up the salts and the minerals um, as it uh, flows across or through those uh, soils. Um, so it comparatively tastes quite sweet. Um, and uh, so for just for, the, for that joyous experience, the taste bud experience, it's, it's worth it. Um, I'd also say that uh, rainwater is a fantastic way to, um, to more deeply and directly connect with where your water comes from. And every rain becomes a celebration um, as you hear and see your tanks fill, as you see and hear your, your basins fill, as you see the vegetation green up. You know, there's a crazy thing about rainwater is- uh